Hey, welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. For this video, I want to talk about a couple novels, Neutron Star and Crash Lander by Larry Niven. I'm putting them both together because they're both collections of Niven's short stories and have several of the same stories in both books. I'm not going to talk about every story in the books. I'm just going to talk about one story that is in both books and say this. All the stories are worth reading in my opinion, but if you only want to buy one, I would suggest Crash Lander. It's a collection of all the Beowulf Schaefer stories my personal favorite known space character. Beowulf Schaefer's stories are fun, exciting, and short, so they get right to the good stuff. His stories are also very informing of the known space universe. They were written pretty early on in Niven's career, but amazingly there are no major retcons from them to his latest books in the Fleet of Worlds series, which in case you didn't know is also set in the known space universe. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Niven very clearly had an idea for how many things in his universe worked straight from the start. For example, in the story I want to highlight today, a puppeteer, out of surprise, accidentally tells Beowulf and Elephant a highly top-secret bit of information. Information that other characters would struggle to figure out in later books. Meaning that instead of having to add more information to his older stories, he actually told too much. But he didn't even have to retcon that because the situation would obviously have required a non-disclosure clause. The information was vital to their specific situation, but it would have also been very dangerous to let out into the general public. So let's talk about the story so you see what I mean. That means it's spoilers time, but just for this one short story in the collections. So I might spoil this story for you, but you have several more that are all just as good. Even though this one's my personal favorite. This story starts off with Beowulf Schaefer, or Bay as he's known to his friends, on his first visit to Earth. Bay was born on the planet of We Made It, named as such because the colony ship that brought the first humans to the planet crashed and it was a miracle they all survived. Hence, the planet was named after the first words spoken on its surface. Because of this, the natives of We Made It are known as Crashlanders. On his trip to Earth, Bay meets a Flatlander, an Earthling, returning home. This man is nicknamed Elephant, but his real name is Gregory Pelton. Pelton comes from a family of wealth, but he wants to make a name for himself. He wants to do something amazing so that nobody could call him a Flatlander anymore. You see, there is a somewhat earned reputation for people from Earth. They are the only ones who live on a planet so welcoming to their form of life that they don't grow up with the constant knowledge that they could kill themselves and maybe everyone they know as well just by opening the wrong door. For example, the summers on We Made It are basically scorching hurricanes, or more accurately, deathly hot trade winds. On Jinx, if you went down the wrong road, you would end up so far down that if the atmospheric pressure didn't kill you, the bandersnatch would. Same for falling off a cliff on Plateau. Every planet except maybe Wonderland was a death trap to the uninformed, but Wonderland had been attacked by the Kazinti, so even that had not always been a paradise. So Bay offers Elephant an idea. Bay had met the Outsiders before, a race of creatures that lived in the vacuum of space. He knew how they operated, so he suggests to Elephant that they buy the information he wants off of them. They are well known for trading information, after all. Elephant thinks this is a great idea and takes him up on it. He brings Bay along with him since he has never dealt with the Outsiders before. The Outsiders give him the location of the strangest planet they know of, but tell him nothing about it otherwise, only its speed, location, and trajectory. A speed, by the way, that was far too fast for Elephant's ship to achieve on its own. But the Outsiders had a solution for that. Their city-sized ship could accelerate to those speeds, and nearly instantly. At that point, all Elephant had to do was travel to the location of the planet, and his ship would keep its velocity and trajectory as it traveled through hyperspace to the planet. Then he would be paralleling the planet. But before they left, the Outsiders offered more information about the planet for an additional 200,000 stars, the currency of known space. Basically just dollars. I've been worried about something, Bay. You said the Outsiders are honorable. They are. They've got to be. They have to be so far above suspicion that any species they deal with will remember their unimpeachable ethics a century later. You can see that, can't you? Outsiders don't show up more often than that. Um, okay. Why did they try to screw that extra 200 kilo stars out of me? Uh, see, the goddamn problem is, what if it was a fair price? What if we need to know what's funny about that fast proto-sun? You're right. Knowing the Outsiders, it's probably information we can use. All right, we'll nose around a little before we land. We'd have done that anyway, but now we'll do it better. When they arrive, they find many peculiarities about the planet and the proto-sun it's orbiting. 
From what they can tell, this star system is not from the Milky Way. Its speed and trajectory would be much more consistent with it coming from outside the galaxy. It's a protostar, but it's too warm for its early point in development. There is also a very large amount of radiation in the system, much higher than would be expected. By the time they got to nine strange things on their list, and none of them would be worth the price the outsiders asked, Bay started to get paranoid. I went right to sleep that night, being pretty tired despite the lack of exercise. Hours later, I slowly realized that I was being examined. I could see it through my closed eyelids. I could feel the heat of the vast red glare, the size of the angry eye, the awful power of the mind behind it. I tried to struggle away, smacked my hand on something, and woke with a shock. I lay there in the red darkness. The edge of the protosun peeked through a window. I could feel its hostile glare. I said, Elephant, would you do me a favor? Sure. Do you want Diane, my right arm, shave off my beard? I'll keep Cheryl, thanks. Put on your suit, will you? Sure, that makes sense. We aren't nearly uncomfortable enough just because we closed off the bubble. Right. And because I'm a dedicated masochist, I'm going to put my suit on this instant. Now I hate to enjoy myself alone. Anything for a friend. You go first. There was just room to get our suits on one at a time. If the inner airlock door hadn't been opened, there wouldn't have been that. We tried leaving our helmets thrown back, but they got in the way against the crash couches, so we taped them to the window in front of us. I felt better that way, but Elephant clearly thought I'd flipped. You sure you wouldn't rather eat with your helmet on? Every few hours they discover another strange aspect of this star system and the planet. But they continue on in their intercept course, intent on being the first humans to ever land on this strange, smooth planet. Half an hour later, we found life. By then, we were close enough to use the gravity drag to slow us. The beautiful thing about the gravity drag is it uses very little power. It converts a ship's momentum relative to the nearest powerful mass into heat. And all you have to do is get rid of the heat. Since the slower than Infinity's hull would only pass various ranges of radiation corresponding to what the puppeteer's varied customers considered visible light, the shipbuilders had run a great big radiator fin out from the gravity drag. It glowed dull red behind us and the fusion drive was off. There was no white flame to hurt visibility. Elephant had the scope at highest magnification. At first, as I peered into the eyepiece, I couldn't see what he was talking about. There was a dull white plane, all the same color except for a few blobs of blue. The blobs wouldn't have stood out except for the uniformity of the surface around them. Then one of them moved. Very slowly, but it was moving. Right, I said, let me run a temperature check. The surface temperature in that region was about right for helium too, and the rest of the planet as well. The proto-sun wasn't putting out much energy, though it was very gung-ho on radiation. So what was it that the outsiders seemingly wanted to warn them about? Was it the radiation? Was the life on the planet dangerous? Or was there still another strange anomaly waiting to kill them? And why were the radiation levels so high, and what made the protostar so hot when it shouldn't be yet? Elephant, what are you doing here? He turned, startled. What do you mean? Look, you know by now I'm with you all the way, but I do wonder. You spent a million stars getting here, and you'd have spent two if you had to. You could be home in the Rockies with Diana, or hovering near Beta Lyrae, which is unusual enough and better scenery than this snowball. You could be sampling oddball drugs and crash landing, or looking for mist demons on Plateau. Why here? Because it is there. What the blazes is that supposed to mean, Bray? Once upon a time, there was a guy named Miller. Six years ago, he took a ram scoop fusion drive ship and put a hyperdrive in it and set out for the edge of the universe, figuring he could get his hydrogen from space and use the fusion plant to power his hyperdrive. He's probably still going. He'll be going forever unless he hits something. Why? A psychiatrist? I'm not. He wants to be remembered. When you're dead a hundred years, what will you be remembered for? I'll be the idiot who rode with Gregory Pelton, who spent two months and more than a million stars to set his ship down on a totally worthless planet. All right, what about abstract knowledge? The star will be out of known space in ten years. Our only chance to explore it is right now. What? There was an almost silent breeze of air, and a strangling pressure in my larynx and a stabbing pain in my ears simultaneously. 
I heard the bare beginnings of an alarm, but I was already reaching for my helmet. I clamped it down hard, spun the collar, and gave vent to an enormous belch at the same time that the wind went shrieking from my lungs. There was no way to realize what was happening, and no time. But vacuum was around us, and air was spraying into my suit. Frigid air. Iron spikes were being driven through my ears, but I was going to live. My lungs held a ghastly emptiness, but I would live. I turned to Elephant. The fear of death was naked on his face. He had his helmet down, but he was having trouble with the collar. I had to force his hands away to get it fastened right. His helmet misted over, then cleared. He was getting air. Had it come in time to save his life? I was alive. The pain was leaving my ears, and I was breathing. Inhale. Pause. Inhale. As the pressure rose to normal. I'd seen what had happened. Now I had time to think it through, to remember it, to play it back. What had happened was insane. The hall had turned to dust. Just that, all at once and nothing first. The ship outside had disintegrated and blown away on a whispering breath of breathing air. I'd seen it. And sure enough, the hall was gone. Only the innards of the ship remained. Before me, the lighted control board. A little below that, the manhole to the packed bubble and the bubble packaging itself. Above the board, the half-disc of the mystery planet and stars. To the left, stars. To the right, elephant, looking dazed and scared. And beyond him, stars. Behind me, the airlock, the kitchen storage block and dial board. A glimpse of the landing legs and glowing radiator fin. And stars. The slower than infinity was a skeleton. Elephant shook his head, then turned on his suit radio. I heard the magnified click in my helmet. We looked at each other, waiting, but there was nothing to say, except, Elephant, look, we don't have a hall no more, isn't that remarkable? I sighed, turned to the control board, and began nursing the fusion drive to life. From what I could see of the ship, nothing seemed to be floating away. Whatever had been fixed to the hall must also have been fixed to other things. What are you doing, Bay? Getting us out of here. Uh, you can scream now. Why? I mean, why leave? He'd flipped. Flatlanders are basically unstable. I got the drive pushing us along at low power, turned off the gravity drag, and turned to face him. Look, elephant, no hull. I swept an arm around me. None. But what's left of the ship is still mine? Uh, yeah, sure. I want to land. Can you talk me out of it? He was serious, completely so. The landing legs are intact, he went on. Our suits can keep out the radiation for three days. We could land and take off in 12 hours. We probably could. And we spent going on two months getting here. Right. I'd feel like an idiot getting this close and then turning for home, wouldn't you? I would, except for one thing. And that one thing says you're landing this ship over my unconscious body. All right, the hull turned to dust and blew away. What does that mean? It means we got a faulty hull. And I'm going to sue the hind legs off of General Products when we get back. But do you know what caused it? No. So why do you assume it's some kind of threat? Tell you what I'll do, I said. I turned the ship until it was tailed down to Cannonball Express. Now we'll be there in three hours if you insist on landing. It's your ship, just as you say, but I'm going to try and talk you out of it. That's fair. Have you had any space pilot training? Naturally. Did it include a history of errors course? I, I don't think so. We got a little history of the state of the art. That's something. You remember that they started out with chemical fuels and that the first ship to the asteroids was built in orbit around Earth's moon? Uh-huh. This you may not have heard. There were three men in that ship, and when they were launched, it was in an orbit that took it just slightly inside the moon's orbit, then out again and away. About 30 hours after launching, the men noticed that all their ports were turning opaque. The concentration of dust in their path was putting little meteor pits all through the quartz. Two of the men wanted to continue on, using instruments to finish their mission. But the third man was in command. They used their rockets and stopped themselves dead. Remember, materials weren't as durable in those days, and nothing they were using had been well tested. The men stopped their ship in the orbit of the moon, which by then was 230,000 miles behind them, and called base to say they'd aborted the mission. You remember this pretty well. How come? 
They drilled these stories into us again and again. Everything they tried to teach us was illustrated with something from history. It stuck. Go on. They called base and told them about their windows fogging up. Somebody decided it was dust, and someone else suddenly realized they'd launched the ship through one of the moon's Trojan points. Elephant laughed, then coughed. Wished I hadn't breathed so much vacuum. I gather you're leading up to something? If the ship hadn't stopped, it would have been wrecked. The dust would have torn it apart. The moral of this story is anything you don't understand is dangerous until you do understand it. Sounds paranoid. Maybe it does to a Flatlander. You come from a planet so kind to you, so seemingly adapted to you, that you think the whole universe is your oyster. You might remember my Neutron Star story. I'd have been killed if I hadn't understood that tidal effect in time. So you would. So you think Flatlanders are all fools? No, Elephant, just not paranoid enough, and I refuse to apologize. Who asked you? I'll land with you if you can tell me what made our hall turn to dust. Elephant crossed his arms and glared forward. I shut up and waited. By and by, he said, Can we get home? I don't know. The hyperdrive motor will work, and we can use the gravity drag to slow us down to something like normal. Physically, we should be able to do it. Okay, let's go. But I tell you this, Bay. If I were alone, I'd go down and damn the hall. So we turned tail and ran, under protest from Elephant. In four hours, we were far enough from Cannonball Express's gravity well to enter hyperspace. I turned on the hyperdrive, gasped, and turned it off just as fast as I could. We sat there shaking, and Elephant said, We can inflate the bubble. But can we get in? It doesn't have an airlock. We worked it, though. There was a pressure control dial in the cabin, and we set it for zero. The electromagnetic field that folded the bubble would now inflate it without pressure. We went inside, pressurized it, and took off our helmets. We're out of the radiation field, said Elephant. I looked. Good. You can go pretty far even in a couple seconds of hyperdrive. Now there's one thing I've got to know. Can you take that again? Elephant shuddered. Can you? I think so. I can do all the navigating if I have to. Anything you can take, I can take. Can you take it and stay sane? Yes. Then we can trade off. But if you change your mind, let me know that instant. A lot of good men have left their marbles in the blind spot, and all they had were a couple of windows. I believe you. Indeed I do, sir. How do we work it? We'll have to chart a course through the least dense part of space. The nearest inhabited world is Kazin. I hate to risk asking help from the Kazinti, but we may have to. Tell you what, Bay. Let's at least try to reach Jinx. I want to use that number of yours to give the puppeteers hell. Sure, we can always turn off to something closer. I spent an hour or so working out a course. When I'd finished, I was pretty sure we could navigate it without either of us having to leave the bubble more than once every 24 hours to look at the mass indicator. We threw fingers for who got the first watch, and I lost. We put on our suits and depressurized the bubble. As I crawled through the manhole, I saw Elephant opaguing the bubble wall. I squeezed into the crash couch, all alone among the stars. They were blue ahead and red behind when I finished turning the ship. I couldn't find the proto-sun. More than half the view was empty space. I found myself looking thoughtfully at the airlock. It was behind and to the left, a metal oblong standing along the edge of the deck with both doors tightly closed. The inner door had slammed when the pressure dropped, and now the airlock mechanisms guarded the pressure inside against the vacuum outside in both directions. Nobody inside to use the air, but how do you explain that to a pressure sensor? I was procrastinating. The ship was aimed. I clenched my teeth and sent the ship into hyperspace. The blind spot, they call it. It fits. There are ways to find the blind spot in your eye. Close one eye, put two dots on a piece of paper, and bring that paper towards you, focusing on one of the dots. If you hold the paper just right, the other dot will suddenly vanish. Let a ship enter hyperspace with the windows transparent, and the windows will seem to vanish. So will the space enclosing them. Objects on either side stretch and draw closer together to fill the missing space. If you look long enough, the blind spot starts to spread. The walls and the things against the wall draw even closer to the missing space until they are engulfed. It's all in your mind, they tell me. So? I turned the key and half my view was blind spot. The control board stretched and flowed. The mass indicator sphere tried to wrap itself around me. I reached for it, and my hands were distorted, too. 
With considerable effort, I put them back in my sides and got a grip on myself. There was one fuzzy green line in the plastic distortion that had been a mass indicator. It was behind and to the side. The ship could fly itself until Elephant's turn came. I fumbled my way to the manhole and crawled through. Hyperspace was only half the problem. It was a big problem. Every 24 hours, one of us had to go out there, see if there were any dangerous masses around, drop back to normal space and take a fix and adjust course. I found myself getting unbearably tense during the few hours before each turn. So did Elephant. At these times, we didn't dare talk to each other. On my third trip, I had the bad sense to look up, and went more than blind. Looking up, there was nothing at all in my field of vision, nothing but the blind spot. It was more than blindness. A blind man, a man whose eyes had lost their function, at least remembers what things looked like. A man whose optic brain center has been damaged doesn't. I could remember what I'd come out here for, to find out if there were any masses near enough to harm us, but I couldn't remember how to do it. I touched a curved glass surface and knew that this was the machine that would tell me if only I knew its secret. Eventually, my neck got sore, so I moved my head. That brought my eyes back into existence. When we got the bubble pressurized, Elephant said, Where were you? You've been gone half an hour. And lucky at that, when you go out there, don't look up. Oh. That was the other half of the problem. Elephant and I had stopped communicating. He was not interested in saying anything. And he was not interested in anything I had to say. It took me a good week to figure out why. Then I braced him with it. Elephant, there's a word missing from our language. He looked up from the reading screen. If there hadn't been a reading screen in the bubble, I don't think we'd have made it. More than one word, he said. Things have been pretty silent. One word. You're afraid... You're so afraid of using that word, you're afraid to talk at all. So tell me. Coward. Elephant wrinkled his brow, then snapped off the screen. All right, bae. We'll talk about it. First of all, you said it. I didn't, right? Right. Have you been thinking it? No. I've been thinking euphemisms like overcautious and reluctance to risk bodily harm. But since we're on the subject, why were you so eager to turn back? I was scared. I let that word soak into him, then went on. The people who trained me made certain that I'd be scared in certain situations. With all due respect, Elephant, I've had more training for space than you have. I think your wanting to land was the result of ignorance. Elephant sighed. I think it would have been safe to land. You don't. We're not going to get anywhere arguing about it, are we? We weren't. One of us was right, one wrong. And if I was wrong, then a pretty good friendship had gone out the airlock. It was a silent trip. We came out of hyperspace near the two serious suns. But that wasn't the end of it, because we still faced a universe squashed by relativity. It took us almost two weeks to break ourselves. The gravity drag's radiator fin glowed orange-white for most of that time. I have no idea how many times we circled around through hyperspace for another run through the system. Finally, we were moving in on Jinx with the fusion drive. I broke a silence of hours. Now what, elephant? As soon as we get in range, I'm going to call that number of yours. Then... Drop you off a serious modder with enough money to get you home. I take it kindly if you use my house as your own until I come back from Cannonball Express. I'll buy a ship here and go back. You don't want me along. With all due respect, Bay, I don't. I'm going to land. Wouldn't you feel like a damn fool if you died then? I've spent about three months in a small extension bubble because of that silly planet. If you conquered it alone, I would feel like a damn fool. Elephant looked excruciatingly unhappy. He started to speak, caught his breath. If ever I picked the right time to shut a man up, that was it. Hold it. Let's call the puppeteers first. Plenty of time to decide. Elephant nodded. In a moment, he'd have told me he didn't want me along because I was overcautious. Instead, he picked up the ship phone. Jinx was a banded Easter egg ahead of us. To the side was binary, the primary to which Jinx is a moon. We should be close enough to talk. And the puppeteer's transfer booth number would also be their phone number. Elephant dialed. A sweet contralto voice answered. There was no picture, but I could tell. No woman's voice is quite that good. The puppeteer said, 88326770. My general products haul just failed. Elephant was wasting no time. I beg your pardon? 
My name is Gregory Pelton. Twelve years ago, I bought a number two haul from General Products. A month and a half ago, it failed. We've spent the intervening time limping home. May I speak to a puppeteer? The screen came on. Two flat, brainless heads looked out at us. This is quite serious, said the puppeteer. Naturally, we will pay the indemnity in full. Would you mind detailing the circumstances? Elephant didn't mind at all. He was quite vehement. It was a pleasure to listen to him. The puppeteer's silly expression never wavered, but he was blinking rapidly when Elephant finished. I see, he said. Our apologies are insufficient, of course, but you will understand that it was a natural mistake. We did not think that antimatter was available anywhere in the galaxy, especially in such quantity. It was as if he'd screamed. I could hear that word echoing from side to side in my skull. Elephant's booming voice was curiously soft. A antimatter? Of course. We have no excuse, of course. But you should have realized it at once. Interstellar gas of normal matter had polished the planet's surface with minuscule explosions, had raised the temperature of the protosun beyond any rational estimate, and was causing a truly incredible radiation hazard. Did you not even wonder about these things? You knew that the system was from beyond the galaxy. Humans are supposed to be highly curious, are they not? The Hall, said Elephant. A general product's hull is an artificially generated molecule with interatomic bonds artificially strengthened by a small power plant. The strengthened molecular bonds are proof against any kind of impact and heat into the hundreds of thousands of degrees. But when enough of the atoms had been obliterated by antimatter explosions, the molecule naturally fell apart. Elephant nodded. I wonder if his voice was gone for good. When may we expect you to collect your indemnity? I gather no human was killed? This is fortunate, since our funds are low. Elephant turned off the phone. He gulped once or twice, then turned to look me in the eye. I think it took all his strength, and if I'd waited for him to speak, I don't know what he would have said. I gloat, I said. I gloat. I was right. You were wrong. If we landed on your forsaken planet, we'd have gone up in pure light. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to say, I told you so. <laughs> he smiled weakly. You told me so. Oh, I did, I did. Time after time, I said, don't go near that haunted planet. It's worth your life and your soul, I said. There have been signs in the heavens, I said, to warn us from this place. All right, don't overdo it, you bastard. You were dead right all the way. Let's leave it at that. Okay, but there's one thing I want you to remember. If you don't understand it, it's dangerous. That's the one thing I want you to remember. Besides, I told you so. <laughs> and that should have ended it, but it doesn't. Elephant's going back. He's got a little flag with a UN insignia about two feet by two feet, with spring wires to make it look like it's flapping in the breeze, and a solid rocket in the handle so it'll go straight when the flag is furled. He's going to drop it on the antimatter planet from a great height, as great as I can talk him into. It should make quite a bang. And I'm going along. I've got a solidly mounted Trity camera and a contract with the biggest broadcasting company in known space. This time, I've got a reason for going. All right, so that was the story Flatlander in the book Crashlander and also in the book Neutron Star. So if you like that at all, like, comment, subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you back here for the next one. Thanks for coming.